Heavenly Father, we are so grateful today that this is your word, and we offer it, and we accord it the respect that it demands. We come before you, our God, today to hear you speak through your truth, to hear you open it to us and to strengthen our hearts this day. Father, we need to be strengthened. We need to be focused because our heart's desire is to glorify God. So we thank you that we have your word before us. It's not the offerings of men or how thankful we are, but the Holy Spirit is the author of this precious truth that we have. Bless our time in it, Father, we pray. Enable the preaching of it and the hearing of it. Father, it's good when we come before you and we realize our own weakness. We realize our own inabilities. We realize our need. And we are together as a congregation declaring before you, Father, we need you. We need to hear you today. Touch us, we pray, with the, the truth of Scripture. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me just read those two verses once again. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Every, every Christian wants to live for God. If you don't want to live for God as a Christian, then the door is over there. That's not me. God wants you to want to serve him. That doesn't mean that we all serve him in the same way. But we all want to serve him. We all want to gossip the gospel to our neighbors and to our friends and to our family. Every Christian not only wants to serve God, wants to honor him, but every single Christian feels the weight of that. Every Christian feels the weight of this desire, because so often we find ourselves thinking that we've let the Lord down and that we, we haven't honored him. But you see, we need to be aware that there's a, there is a conflict that is ongoing between the two natures. The tension that exists between the flesh and the spirit. Galatians 5.17 tells us that the flesh and the spirit don't agree with one another. And the flesh wants what's contrary to the spirit, and the spirit wants what's contrary to the flesh. And because that's the case, the tension between the two causes inner conflict so often in the heart of the believer, where we are wrestling to do the right thing by God. Even the great apostle Paul was beautifully open about this battle within himself in Romans 7. He sums it up in Romans 7 verse 18 and 19. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, 
but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Is that not marvelous? To hear the apostle speak like that. Because all Paul is doing there is describing the battle that goes on within every believer. We want to do what is good. We know what is good. We want to do what is good, but we don't find the strength to do it because the flesh leads us to do the wrong thing. How often have you been in that position where you've then felt, I'm never going to get the victory here. I'm never going to manage to do what is right. Well, what do we do when our flesh flexes its muscles against us? You see, the Apostle Paul in that same chapter in, in Romans it says that he is saved from this only through the Lord Jesus. In verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Not only do we have the same battle as the Apostle Paul, but we've got the same avenue to victory as the Apostle Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we can't do what we really do want to do, when we keep failing to get it right, the Lord Jesus Christ saves us from that. The Lord Jesus Christ brings us out of that battle, that struggle. What I mean is the condemnation is gone because he goes on in Romans 8 to say that there, I love these verses. There is therefore now no condemnation. Why is there now no condemnation? Because Paul has been taken out of this fleshly battle, this fleshly struggle in Christ Jesus. And Paul isn't going to pay the price for his fleshly struggle. He isn't going to pay the price for getting it wrong. Why? Because Jesus Christ paid the price for Paul getting it wrong. Are you no thrilled at that this morning, Christian? You've, you've done what's wrong, but you've tried to do what's right. It's, you've failed, and you think, oh my goodness, what a wretched man, what a wretched woman I am. Who's going to save me? The Lord Jesus Christ is going to save you, and because the Lord Jesus Christ took your failure, you can now also read Romans 8, 1 and on, where you're told there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And that's you, brother or sister. We walk according to the spirit or that's the desire of our heart. And when we fail, it's already been dealt with. Praise the Lord. But how do we experience this? How do we experience the sense of this lack of condemnation? Because I know you condemn yourself. And I know that the devil condemns you. Maybe other people condemn you. So how do we get this awareness within our lives of there being no condemnation from God? How do we do that, particularly at the moments when we feel most vulnerable to the old desires? and the old ways. Well, the title of our message is Stop Wrestling. Stop Wrestling. Get out the ring. 
You don't need to be in the wrestling ring. The enemy has been defeated. The opponent has been put on the canvas. And he's not getting back up to win the victory. He might cause you struggles. He might cause you to flinch. But it's done. Stop wrestling. And our passage is helpful in seeing how we do that. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. If you look at verse 6, you'll notice that there's, there is passivity and there's activity. There's being passive, there's being active in that verse. In verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. What do I mean by this passive and active? Well, we're passive in that we're told that we received the Lord. We received Christ Jesus the Lord. It wasn't our doing in any manner whatsoever. We didn't contribute to it in any way. It is entirely, absolutely, completely, and thoroughly a work of God. In John 1.12, we're told that we've been given power to be called the children of God. We're told in John that Chapter 1, that it wasn't about us. It wasn't about our desire. It wasn't about our effort. We aren't born of man. We're born of God. It all comes from God. And verses we love, of course, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. We earned absolutely nothing, but we received absolutely everything. Every believer in here today earned nothing, but you got it all. That which we didn't have, we were given. We didn't have salvation. We didn't have hope. We didn't have a future. We didn't have glory to look for but we've been given it all through Christ Jesus. We've received absolutely everything. He gave us Jesus Christ, and by his Spirit, he drew us to Jesus Christ. It's because of him, 1 Corinthians 1.30, it is of him that we are in Christ Jesus. From before the foundation of the world, we were chosen in him. How many times have I quoted that? Oh, you're going to get really, really familiar with me quoting that kind of verse because that thrills my heart so deeply and so completely that my salvation, that I live every day, that I enjoy every day, my salvation that's taken me home to glory. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! It was all by the grace of Almighty God. It is all of grace. Spurgeon was right when he wrote his wee book. It's all of grace. Praise God for that. And so we are sitting here, having received it all. We were passive. A man can receive nothing, says John the Baptist unless it's given him from heaven. John 3, 27. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do you have that you weren't given? And if you've been given it, why are you boasting as if you did it yourself? So we're here today, brothers and sisters, and we don't boast there is no room for boasting in the Christian life because the life we have, the, the, the hope we have, the future we have has been given to us by Christ, through Christ, by God through Christ. And we, we have got nothing to claim. So we were passive in that we received him. 
But Paul also says in this verse that we have to be active. How can you be passive and active at the same time? As we received Christ Jesus, says in verse 6, we are to walk in him. As ye therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That's what we do. We receive him and then we live for him and in him. That's the active part of being a believer. We receive salvation through faith alone, trusting in the work of the cross for everything. And Paul says that's how you should live, by faith. We receive him by faith. Yes. We live for him by faith. We were washed in the blood of the Lamb through faith in that blood, through faith in what Jesus did at Calvary. And we live every day of our lives through faith in what Jesus did at Calvary. That means when we look at ourselves in the mirror in the morning, we can say, a new day, here we go. And then you look at yourself in the mirror at night and you go, oh, done it again. But hear the whisper. Hear the whisper in your heart that comes from Almighty God. What does that whisper say? You live by faith. And so what you've done through the day, you better believe before you close your eyes at night that the cross of Jesus Christ has taken care of it. And get down on your knees and give it all back over to him and thank him for the blood that saved me and the blood that keeps me clean until I get home to glory. We live by faith. The righteous don't live by sight. They live by faith. We don't live by doing good works. We live by faith. We're not, we do good works, oh, we do good works, but that's not where the value comes from to us. That's not how we're evaluated. We live by faith. Now, I've said this before, I'll say it again, and I'll probably say it forevermore. That's the truth of the matter. Don't you sit there this morning thinking, oh, I messed up again last night. Well, Oh, the blood. The blood has cleansed you. The blood has set you free. There is now no condemnation because of the blood. Now you walk every day of your life living in the power of Calvary, knowing that every day you're free to live a fresh, fresh day. And when you trip up and your face hits the pavement, get back up on your feet. On you go. The blood is taking care of it. Do you believe me? Isn't it marvelous that this is our Savior? That we have received, we've, we've received Jesus Christ through faith. We live for Jesus Christ through faith. That's why we hear Paul trying to explain it. In Galatians 2 and 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you hear Paul trying to get that clear? I've been crucified, yet I'm alive. The life I live, it's not me that's living it, it's Christ that's living it. 
I live this life by faith. Faith that the risen Lord lives in me. Faith that the risen Lord will take me to where I need to go. Paul speaking for every one of us. The crucified and risen Jesus lives in each one of us by his spirit. It's his life that we live. We live, but it's his life we live. We live, it's him living through us. And here's the thing, if we're trusting in him by faith every day, he doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't get it wrong. When we take our eyes off him, we get it wrong. And then he comes back and he says, you're crucified and risen with me. Hallelujah. On we go. I love that. I love to think that my errors haven't stopped the Lord Jesus Christ. That even although I've messed up, he still lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith. Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave himself for me because he needed to if I was going to be with him. And the blood he shed powerful. Powerful. He'll never lose its power. Who do you think you are that your sin is more powerful than the blood of Jesus? You've got a big hit for yourself, you know. The blood of Jesus has taken care of it. Praise God Almighty. Set free from all of that. But... I still don't feel it. Here's what I feel. I'm being told that there's no condemnation. I've been told now that the, the righteousness of Christ has been given to me because I walk as a believer. And here's what I do. This is probably what you do. Roll up the sleeves. Roll up the sleeves. Listen the tie. I've got some spiritual business to attend to. I've got a life to live for Jesus Christ, and I'm going to make him happy with me. You ever been there? where you've rolled up the sleeves, you've loosened the tie, you've put your trainers on so you can run even faster. And then Daniel posted something this week. Uh, I think it was this week or the end of last week, quoting Cory Ten Boom. She said, when I try... I fail when I trust he succeeds. How do we get this to this place where we feel the sense of honoring God, the sense of being effective for God? We get to that place when we stop trusting in what we can do for him and we start trusting fully in what he has done. And what happens is his victory, his success, his effectiveness, his life begins to shine through ours. That's the victory. That's how we honor God. We don't honor God or glorify God by piling up the things we've done. We honor God and glorify God by saying none of that stuff that I have done means anything. The only thing that matters is what Christ has done and what Christ is doing through me as he lives his life as my risen Savior with all resurrection power in me. 
Isn't that a beautiful thought? Isn't that a glorious thing to realize that every day we live, we can live in the power of Christ? Every day we live, we can live with confidence when we trust that what we need has been provided through Calvary. What do you need more than anything else? Well, what we needed more than anything else was for our sin to be forgiven. That was the great need of our lives. The great need of humanity is the forgiveness of sin. And that great need was taken care of. It was dealt with completely. And every sin that you can imagine ever having committed or ever committing, was brought in under that powerful sacrifice. What you did yesterday or the day before, do you know that it didn't surprise him? Oof. I hadn't taken that one into account. No. <laughs> Purified. The blood of Jesus has purified us from all sin. When we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You need to rejoice in your heart this morning that you cannot surprise God. You cannot surprise Jesus Christ by the sin that you commit. You cannot make him love you more by getting everything right all of the time. And you cannot cause him to love you less by tripping up and getting bruised and battered. He loves you exactly the same from that moment he died for you, well, from before the foundation of the world. But it was expressed beautifully at Calvary and forevermore he loves you exactly the same. One of the joys for us as Christians is knowing this, that when we stand before God in glory, we will not be loved any more than we are loved right now. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. He cannot love us more than Calvary, and we praise his holy name for that today. So we have to be passive as we receive him, and then we have to be active as we Trust him. Cast ourselves upon him. That's what it means to labor for Christ. Cast yourself upon him all the time. And every moment that temptation, every time that temptation comes up, cast ourselves at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cast ourselves upon the cross, the work of the cross, realizing that it's dealt with. Can you feel that joy in your heart this morning? Can you feel a burden lifting from your heart this morning when you realize that when you bring it to Jesus Christ and you've dragged it and it's been weighing you down and you've brought it to Jesus Christ and he's seen it and he said, I, I know, I died for that. Can you feel it getting lifted? We cannot do anything that will make him take a step back and shake his head because his arms were stretched out and they were nailed to the cross. By that sin that you bring to him. But I hadn't committed it until two minutes ago. I know. But doesn't it make you smile? Doesn't it just take your breath when you realize he saw it? He saw it before he chose you. <laughs> but he still chose you. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are children of God. Praise God. Stop wrestling. Stop
stop wrestling. Just trust him. Doesn't your heart go out to people who are caught up in what I must, what I must, what I must not, what I must not. I can't go there. I can't do that. I can't say this and I can't think that. If that's the thing that comes to you, if that's your way of thinking, then you need to also think this. Who's condemning you? Who's condemning us when we get to that place? Causing our life in Christ to be so hard and up and down and twisty turny, good and bad, hot and cold. Who's causing that? It is not Almighty God. It is not our Savior. The devil's causing that. Your flesh is causing that. Your pride is causing that. How wonderful just to say, I'm taking this jacket off. I'm taking this backpack off and I'm putting it down. It's weighing me down. It's keeping me back. You see, I've got a, I've got a mountain top to reach. And that's keeping me back. I've got a goal to reach. It's not a goal that I set. It's not a goal I'll achieve. But I'll never achieve it if I, if I carry this stuff with me. My sin, my self-condemnation, my guilt and my shame. If I keep carrying this with me, I'm not getting there. I'm taking this off. I'm putting it down. I'm heading on with Jesus Christ. And when I get to that goal and when I achieve that goal, I'll turn around and say, it wasn't me. It was him. It was the one who walked with me. It was the one who picked me up when I fell. It's the one who carried me all the way over the line. Oh, hallelujah. When we get home to glory, we will not at all turn around and say, wow, that was a struggle, but I'm glad I got there. I worked hard. When we get home to glory, we're going to look full in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to say, it was nothing to do with me. It was all of grace. It was all him. He made me able to get home. He took me home. You see, as we receive the Lord Jesus Christ through faith, we live by faith, trusting. Do you believe what the Bible says about Calvary? Do you believe that your infirmities were taken care of? Your sin was taken care of? Your sicknesses were taken care of? Do you believe all your struggles were taken care of at Calvary? And I know you're sitting there and you're struggling with one thing or another. I know you are, because I am. But where we need to be in our minds is this. Jesus did it. People abused me, you may be saying. And I'm struggling with the way people treated me. Jesus died for that at Calvary. To set you free from that way of thinking. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful? We can now live for him by faith. Just let that burden be lifted off your shoulders. But how do we do that? How do we get to that place where we have Jesus Christ living powerfully through us? How do we get to that place where we are able to say we're living for God? Verse 7, we've received him and we walk by faith in him. And that faith 
which is the channel through which the life of Christ expresses itself in and through us, grows and develops, becomes more powerful as we are rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Our successful or effective living for God by faith is not some kind of positive mental attitude I'm believing God for this. I'm believing God for that. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm believing for this. I've not even looked to see what the Bible says, but I'm, I'm believing for this because this is what I want. Hold on. Has God spoken to you through the Scriptures? Has God brought Scripture to you either as you read the Bible or as a, a brother or sister spoke to you in conversation, unbeknownst to them, giving you a word from God? Have you been looking for something, hoping for something, and feel that God is leading you towards something, but you, but you don't have a word? Or maybe you've been thinking that and you've come to church and you've heard somebody preach and they preach a message and it's like they're sitting you down and saying to you, this is just for you. Every one of us has been there. Every one of us has been in that place where we've heard God speaking to us and the preacher has had no idea. Oh, that's good that the preacher has no idea. God forbid that the preacher would ever have an idea of who he's speaking to and what he's saying and how effective he's being because he would not get out that back door. His head would be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's a blissful thing for a pastor or a preacher to be ignorant of the issue that's happening right now in front of him as he preaches. Who do we think we are? But isn't it marvelous that when we live for God, when we know we're being effective for God, what it really means is that we are being rooted and built up and that the word of God is speaking to my heart and it's making me stronger. That's living in, a, in, a, in an effective way for God. Are you feeling that at all? You, have you experienced that moment when you've been flat on your face To use a terminology that I've used before, and it's, it's not my terminology, Gary, by the way, it's Andy Martin, feeling like a burst ball. Another one, like a burst couch. Have you ever felt that way? And you've come to church, and you've heard a word that's inflated you again. That is being effective. That is living by faith. Did you know that? I've come in here in the right mess. Well, I went out feeling different. You see, coming in in the right mess, you weren't a failure. You weren't a failure. When you come into church in a right mess, why are you coming? Because you have faith that he is going to do something. And then when he speaks to you through the word, whether it be from scripture, preached, conversation, or song, when he speaks to you through the word, that faith that brought you in is strengthened and you go out feeling different because he has strengthened you. You received him by faith and you live for him by faith. And when you come to church, you come in faith that God is going to speak. 
Surely, surely none of us are here today to hear what the pastor has to say. Surely none of you would be so foolish as to come to this church or any church to hear what the pastor has to say. I don't care what any pastor has to say. I don't care who he is. I don't care what he has to say if what he has to say isn't coming from Almighty God. I don't care. Speak to me through the Bible. Tell me what God says, Pastor. I don't want to hear what you have to say particularly. Tell me what he says, because it's when he tells me what he wants of me that this weak and feeble faith that I'm feeling is strengthened and I can live for him more effectively. I can't do it myself, but when he speaks, I can do it because he's doing it. Don't you love the Lord? Don't you love the fact that we have the Bible? Other, other religions have their holy book. But we have the Bible. I don't care what religion it is and what holy book it is. The Bible is the word of God. And we can engage with God through his word and be strengthened, rooted, and built up. You see, our effectiveness depends upon being rooted and built up in Christ. And the way in which we're rooted and built up in Christ is by feeding upon the Word of God. And if we're to live for him, that's what's required. So where should our labor be? In doing stuff? No. Our labor should be in the scriptures. We should be as we are, in inverted commas, accused of being people of the book. Well, they may accuse us of that in some kind of derogatory sense, but we are people of the book. People of the book, the sons of God, who listen to hear what he has to say. Rooted as the roots go down, and as the roots spread out in the word of God, we're just like trees whose roots go down, whose roots spread out to give them health and strength. We're the same. We're rooted in the soil of Jesus Christ. Our roots go down deep into Jesus Christ. Our roots go out wide into Jesus Christ as we consume the word of God. We see more about him. We learn more about him. We understand more about him. And we realize this is my savior. I had a wonderful conversation with Andreen at the through the week on Wednesday. Was it Wednesday? Wonderful in the sense that we were building one another up, just talking about God, just talking about who this God is. And we see God through all the scriptures and all the marvelous, amazing things he has done, the different appearances of God and the different ways that he has appeared. We think of the, the parting of the ocean, the parting of the Jordan. We think of the fire coming down on Mount Carmel. We think of the flood. We think of putting Noah in the ark and with all his family. We think of all these amazing out workings of the presence and power of Almighty God, and many more. And he's our God. We were speaking to him on Wednesday night, Friday night. We were, it was Friday, we were, after the, the business meeting on Wednesday, and we continued it for a while on Friday. But even, even on Wednesday, we were, we were praying to this one. We were, we were speaking to this great God, our Savior. 
You see, when we grasp this, my life, my life is lived in the gaze of that great one. Every step I take under his gaze. But more than that, he lives in me. I don't need to trust in myself. I don't need to do it. I don't need to work it up. I don't need to, to pile up my good works and think, oh, God will be happy. I just need to say, look, I cannot do this. I cannot live this life. I cannot live any further. I can't go one more step. This is way too much for me. And at that moment, we rejoice with the next breath because we say, well, because I cannot, I give it all over to him who can. Him who can, him who will, and him who wants to. Trust that the cross gave me everything I need. For every day to be effective for Christ. The roots go down. That's why we love some the first psalm. And this is only one passage. There are so many that speak in similar terms. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the sorrowful. Wow. Well, pastor, that kind of describes me. Ah, but listen. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. That's what we've to do. We've not to walk in sinful ways. We've to meditate in the, in the word of God, delight in the word of God. And then verse 3 says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Because he's trusting in Almighty God through devouring the word of God, meditating on the word of God so that we will no longer walk in the sinful ways. We will, now you know what I mean when I say we no longer, it is no longer the habit of our lives. We get it wrong, but we will no longer habitually fall for this lie. We are in the word of God and we will be like strong oaks of righteousness because he is living through us more and more and more to be built on him the next aspect that paul mentions here rooted and built up wow the sure foundation Christ is the sure foundation upon which we build our lives, upon which we build the church. Christ, I think it's still there, the text. He's the foundation that has been laid. Aren't you glad that here in Zion that Pastor Glass didn't lay himself as the foundation? Aren't you glad he laid Christ as the foundation? Well, you see, we are all building upon that foundation. And our lives should be built upon that foundation. This church will be built, will be built upon the foundation of Christ Jesus. That is where we find our strength. That is where we will always find our strength. We will find it in him. And when the foundation is secured, when the foundation is sure, the building stands strong, the building of your life and of mine. And nothing that comes against us will cause us to panic to the degree that we 
give up the ghost and say, oh, that's it, finished. I'm walking away from the church of Christ. I'm walking away because this is too much for me. Oh, may we never, ever, I don't mean walking away from this, any particular fellowship, but walking away from the church, walking away from Jesus, may we never get to that place. Never, ever. Oh, Lord, preserve us. Preserve us in Jesus so that we have the awareness at those difficult, vulnerable moments that we can say, ah, but he's done it all. I don't need to wrestle with this anymore. I'm just giving it to him. And it's not even so much that I'm just giving it to him. He's demanding it of us. Hand it over. Oh, I pray that you hear Jesus saying that today. I pray that the Holy Spirit says to the church, says to each one of us, just hand it over. It's been dealt with, so just get rid. Can you say that? Or are you being condemned? Is the devil having a wee go? Is he in your mind and telling you these lies? You know he's a liar, the father of lies. We heard on Friday he's a murderer from the beginning. We have the word of truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. And how did Jesus pray that the Lord God Almighty would use his word? Sanctify them. Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth. What is sanctification? It's the progression of holiness in our lives as we make our way home to glory. And God, the Spirit, will use the word of God to sanctify us. How good is the God we adore? Do you feel that in your life today? Do you hope for that in your life today? Just to surrender everything up and say, Lord Jesus Christ, I've gone as far as I can go and it's only been a couple of steps and this journey is too great for me. Elijah, the journey is too great for you. Get up and eat. What did he eat? He ate the bread. He feasted on Christ. He drank the water. He drank deeply of the Holy Spirit. How do we live effectively for God? Not by accomplishing Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is accomplished because we've been feeding on the word. We've been feeding on the word, drinking in the water. Then Mount Carmel comes when God does the work in us to make us fit for what's coming. And we can really rejoice that our God is our God, that Jesus is our Christ, that what I need to be, he will make me. Jesus didn't say to the disciples, go be fishers of men. He says, I will make you fishers of men. Isn't that good? We can't even evangelize apart from Jesus. I will make you fishers of men, praise the Lord. I will make you what you need to be. I will make you the vessel that you need to be. I will make you what God desires of you. So is there anyone perfect? No. Thank you, Sharon. Sharon was shaking her head to admit that she is not perfect. The rest of you need to take a leaf out of Sharon's book. 
Not one of us in this building is perfect. We get it wrong. We get it wrong. And we get it wrong again. But Paul says, I press on. Forgetting what's behind, I press on to reach that mark. I am going home because I have received the high calling of God and nothing is going to get in my way. Nothing is going to stop me from reaching what God has intended for me. Nothing is going to take me off the pathway upon which God has set my feet. We receive Christ Jesus through faith. We are to live for Christ Jesus through faith, trusting in what he has accomplished. And we do that by feeding on him, feeding on him through the word of God. And let this awareness grow and develop and be expressed all the more through us. Did you know that the word of God is active? That the word of God is alive and active First Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The word of God is at work when we read it, when we take it in, when we receive it from the scripture clearly as the word of God, when we hear it preached by those that we trust as the word of God, when we receive the word of God as the word of God, it does something in us. It works in us to make us more like Jesus so that when we live our lives, he is more and more expressed through us. That is to live effectively for God. When we stop struggling and trust completely, Finish with this quick last phrase. The result or the consequence of living in the way we've said is thanksgiving, praise and worship, the acknowledgement of God, the glorification of God, to lift up his name and rejoice in who he is. We want to glorify God in this church. We want to glorify God. It says at the very beginning of the message, our desire is to honor God. Well, when we live life like this and we begin to see that it's not my effort, it's my faith. It's not my effort for Jesus. It's my faith in Jesus that makes the difference in my life. When we get to that point, the result is worship. We glorify God because we realize that it has only been him. It cannot have been anybody else, not me, nor anyone else helping me. It is all Jesus Christ. And so what we do is we sing and make melody to the Lord in our hearts. So let me just finish by saying, May we abound with thanksgiving this, today. May we abound with thanksgiving as we stop wrestling to get it right. Let's be diligent, but let's be diligent in our faith. Let us rest. Stop wrestling and rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. 
Father, we thank you for your great and glorious teaching that Jesus is sufficient. We don't want to be wrestling anymore. We don't want to be struggling anymore. We want to be resting in Christ. Resting in the truth of what he accomplished. Resting by faith in the scriptures that speak of what Jesus has accomplished. Open our hearts, Lord God, we pray this day. Open our hearts and open our minds and open our lives. Cause us to surrender. Cause us to surrender. Father, we pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.